Hello and welcome to the lesson on writing the introduction. Let's take a look at where we are in the project management approach. We have moved through the initiating phase with scientific paper structure. We have moved through the planning phase with building our reference library and pre-writing, making figures and tables. So we are here at the beginning of the executing phase, getting ready to write the introduction. So this is exciting. We're finally getting into the main body of the work. The learning outcomes for this lesson are as follows. First, I want you to be able to explain the purpose of an introduction. You should be able to explain the key elements in an introduction. You should be able to structure your introduction to funnel from general information to specific information. You should be aware of how to signpost all of your key elements in the introduction section. And you should be able to avoid the common problems of the introduction section. So let's look at a quote from William Zinser. And William Zinser was an author who wrote a lot in uh, magazines back when, when magazines were a big thing. A lot of people read them. And he also wrote a book about writing that's a very highly regarded and well-respected book. And so this quote is from that book. He says, the most important sentence in any article is the first one. If it doesn't induce the reader to proceed to the second sentence, your article is dead. And if the second sentence doesn't induce the reader to continue to the third sentence, it's equally dead. Of such a progression of sentences, each tugging the reader forward until he is hooked, a writer constructs that faithful unit, the lead. So in our case, I think we should substitute the word sentence for paragraph. Um, so let's say in your scientific article, the first paragraph is the most important one because it's going to get the reader to continue forward. So let's think about what are the functions of the introduction. So that quote gives away some of that. The function overall of the introduction is to get the reader to read the rest of the paper. So that goes along with our first point here, to get the readers interested in what you will be telling them. Not only that, but you're going to provide the context for what you will be telling them. You're also going to use this section to let the reader know why your topic is important. So how does it fit into the bigger picture? How is it significant? You know, what is the scope of this problem? Or is it, very speci is it a very specific problem that's been hard to solve? Also, and this last point is extremely important, it lets the readers know what to expect in the rest of the paper. And we're going to, uh, we're going to expand on that idea over the next few slides. When you write the introduction, you're going to have a few different tenses, a few different verb tenses. As you're writing this section, you're going to be citing references to establish the who, what, when, where, why, and how context of the paper. So most of this discussion that you're doing in the introduction section is about current understanding and current knowledge gaps. And therefore, you should present it in the present tense. So information that has been published, we consider to be part of the knowledge base, so it should be presented in the present tense form. But you might want to present some of the introduction in the past tense form, depending on how the results of, your pre of these previous studies relate to your research question. So if it's something that has been observed, but you're going to call it into question, that's when you would want to present it in the past tense, as if it's not quite certain and your work is going to address that. So there's going to be a mixture of present tense and past tense in the introduction, and maybe in the final paragraph, a little bit of future tense, but most of it's going to be present tense. What is the content that you put into the introduction? First of all, you want to try to keep the introduction short. You're not writing a history of your field. You're not writing a review paper here. You're giving background to the research question. So keep it short and make sure you include the following elements. 
the background information. So these are the knowns. In the first lesson, we talked about knowledge bricks to build up walls of knowledge. That's probably the easiest thing to do. Secondly, you're going to discuss the problems and the unknown factors. These are your unknowns or your knowledge gaps. And so it's a little bit harder to expose those and you do it by showing what's already known so that you can point out what is not known. Third, in the introduction, you need to discuss how the research will address knowledge gaps that you just pointed out. And this is going to be done in the form of your research question or purpose statement. So it could be a hypothesis or a purpose statement. Now, point number four is optional, but I like to include it in the introduction. A overview or a preview of the experimental approach and some of your key results. Uh, I like to put it here because I feel like it builds interest. When the readers see a little bit about the approach that you're going to take and you give them a taste of what the results are, that makes it more interesting and builds some suspense. So they want to keep reading at that point. Point number five is the significance. So you're going to talk about how your research advances knowledge or how your research can be used in the future. Think about writing your paper as if you are a journalist. So these are the journalists question. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Think about if you're presenting all of that information. The who in this case may not refer to people, but you might treat your uh, research subjects as entities, even if they're not. So for example, if you're studying iron deficiency in plants, you might treat iron and plants as the who part of the, of the equation. So think about the order you present these facts to tell your story. Try to make sure that they're all there. If any of them are missing, that's going to lead to confusion in, the, in uh, your readers, and they're going to not follow your paper as well as they could have. Now this slide should be familiar to you. You have seen it before. This shows how the background knowledge bricks in your introduction should make the knowledge gaps clear. And when those knowledge gaps are clear, that's going to logically lead you directly to a research question that you can pose to address those knowledge gaps and fill them. So the knowledge gaps are going to frame your research question and then that's going to lead directly to objectives one, two, three, or however many objectives you break that research question into. So again, remember that the introduction has a funnel structure. The first paragraph is going to be the broadest, the most general. And what you're going to do in that first paragraph is to set the stage by giving the broad context of your work. In other words, the 30,000 foot view. So when you're looking out the window of the airplane, you can see the big picture, right? You see the overall landscape. That's what you're doing in this first paragraph. You're trying to also explain the scope and the importance of your topic. So how many people have the disease? How much does it cost because of this problem? Those kinds of things, numbers are really helpful to explain the scope. As you move into the second paragraph and following that into the middle paragraphs, you're going to give an increasingly more specific background to keep establishing your knowledge bricks or the knowns. And that's going to lead you within those second or third paragraphs to the, uh, the knowledge gaps. So what is not known in your field. Continuing on with the funnel structure, when you get to the next to last paragraph, this is where you're going to present the research question that, if you answer it, will fill the knowledge gap. And depending on the type of research you're doing, you may present this research question as a purpose statement, or you may present it as a hypothesis. Um, I just like to use the umbrella term research question because it captures any type of scientific setup. Then in the final paragraph of the introduction, what you'll do is briefly describe your experimental approach, give a, a preview or a teaser of your key results, and talk about the significance again, but in an outward directed sense, showing how your work is going to impact your field and how your results are going to impact society. So we have significance in terms of the scope of the problem, and then we have at the end of the introduction significance in terms of the application of your knowledge 
So let's go back to this graphic one more time. What I recommend you do is start writing the introduction with the research question and then work backwards from the research question to the knowledge gaps and then to the background that you need to show to illustrate those knowledge gaps. And then you also move forward from there. So the, the research question is really your central theme. Your entire paper is going to be written to reflect back to this research question. You're going to come back to it in the results. You're going to come back to it in the discussion. So set it up very carefully in the introduction. This is going to make your job a lot easier as you write the paper, and it's going to make your reader's job a lot easier if you have written it very carefully.